we are going to talk about scalar field visualization beginning from uh, today and for the next three weeks. In the past couple of lectures, we have um, seen how data needs to be prepared in order to make it ready for um, visual representation. So now we will actually talk about the um, uh, geometry extraction step. So where the data uh, that is of interest um, is converted into uh, some geometry which can be displayed. And our focus is going to be on uh, scalar field data. Um, so the first technique that, uh, uh, that we are going to see in the context of scalar field data is isosurface extraction. This is the technique that we are going to see in detail. Uh, but before talking about isosurfaces, I want to um, introduce some standard techniques for scalar field visualization. Let's start with data defined over a 1D domain, so 1D scalar fields. This is um, not surprising uh, that um, uh, we visualize 1D data by mapping every point uh, uh, to a point in a 2D domain. So this is something that we have seen uh, uh, since our school days. Um, but let's in try to introduce this problem more formally. So what is a scalar field? A scalar field uh, f is a real valued function um, which maps every point on the domain to some real value. So uh, we talk about D as uh, a one-dimensional domain, so for example, a line. Examples of scalar fields uh, could be temperature, pressure, density, uh, and so on. Um, and like I said, a very simple way to visualize such data is by plotting a curve that represents uh, F. So note that we require two dimensions in order to um, visualize this 1D scalar field in this form. Of course, um, um, visualizations um, uh, in this form, um, uh, have, have a, there, there is a lot of choice in the axes, um, the scaling of these axes and so on the number of samples. Um, often the data is um, sampled and what we really have is um, um, sample points which uh, may have to be connected together in order to um, in order to be uh, so sample points such as what is shown here. Uh, so these sample points may have to be connected together via straight lines uh, resulting in a piecewise linear representation and this is the piecewise linear curve that represents our scalar field. Moving on to 2D, um, uh, so the question now is uh, we, how do we visualize a 2D scalar field? So an example of a 2D scalar field would be a function f that is defined over the plane. Um, so how do we visualize a 2D scalar field? Well, we try and extend uh, uh, what we understand from 1D scalar fields. Um, so that's clearly the first approach. Um, so we extend the uh, function plot. Uh, so earlier for 1D functions we had a, a curve plot. Uh, now we have a surface plot. Um, another way to visualize scalar fields is by mapping um, each scalar value to some color. Uh, so it's also called color mapping. 
So what you see here in this picture is a visualization of a 2D scalar field using uh, two techniques, um, uh, both the function plot and the color map. So the color map here is um, goes from uh, dark red to yellow for low to high values. And uh, the vertical axis is uh, the height is uh, used to display the function as a surface. A third technique um, for visualizing 2D scalar fields is via um, a so-called contour plot. So these are curves with equal scalar value. So for example, this is a picture that we have seen often um, called an isocontour plot. So these are collections of curves where uh, if you look at a single curve, this is the set of all points which have a given value C. So, so what we see here is a collection of such curves, the pre-image of a single value C where C belongs to R. So typically C takes the values which is in the range of the function. We will look at contours in more detail um, later. In fact, that is the focus of today's lecture. Um, however, before talking about that, let's look at what we can do in 3D. Um, like I said, um, a one way to visualize data is by trying to mimic what you can do in lower dimensions. So we could uh, try to uh, 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 generate a function plot, a surface plot. However, now the domain is already three dimensions. So this seems difficult, right? So we have the function now defined over a 3D domain. Um, it takes real values, however the domain is 3D. So this is going to be uh, difficult uh, now to uh, plot the function as some uh, surface in 4D. So that technique does not work. The, other, the second technique that we saw in 2D was to map every scalar value to color. Now this does work. Uh, and we will see this later um, as uh, the second class of techniques for scalar field visualization. Uh, so let's postpone that discussion for now. Uh, the third technique that we saw for uh, 2D domains is um, contour plot. And uh, this contour plot does extend to 3D. Um, and we will see that in the next slide. Uh, so to summarize, two of the techniques that works for 2D do extend to 3D. Uh, and that is, that is actually going to be the focus of much of um, uh, our discussion on scalar field visualization. So in this slide, I want to talk about another approach for visualizing 3D scalar fields. Um, if we don't know how to visualize a 3D function, we try to find 2D functions here that where we know how to uh, visualize. So um, how do you go from a 3D function to a 2D function? Um, well, one obvious way is to restrict the domain um, um, uh, and, uh, so, and look at the function restricted to this domain. So let me say that again. Um, so what we are now looking at is f restricted to some uh, subdomain. Uh, so the subdomain is some d prime, right? Now if this d prime is two dimensional, then the f restricted to d prime um, is going to be a two dimensional uh, scalar field and we know how to visualize such a scalar field. So here one uh, approach is to take a plane which is shown here 
um, take a plane and look at the intersection of the plane with the domain. So um, uh, what is shown in this picture is a cube domain, right? So the domain is actually not the whole of R3, rather this is the unit cube, uh, sometimes referred to as I3. So in this case, um, our F actually takes this form. It goes from the unit cube, which is um, your um, 0 to 1 in each, uh, along each axis. Right. Um, so that is F, and what we are trying to do is to uh, look at the intersection of a plane with this volume. Um, and if you look at the uh, intersection which is shown here in blue, um, uh, we have a 2D domain and the function restricted to that particular 2D domain. And now we know how to visualize the 2D function using color plot, uh, color map or uh, surface plot. Um, now when applied to real data, this is what uh, uh, we get. Now there is some context shown here by um, displaying the surface corresponding to this human head. Um, so the data here is an MRI scan of the human head and um, the data is visualized by showing the surface of the human head together with a slice. Now the slicing is um, done along each of the axes in the top row, uh, the X, Y and Z. Uh, axis and in the bottom row uh, the slicing is uh, with respect to an um, arbitrarily oriented plane. We can see that there is a lot of value in um, looking at uh, uh, this slice view and allowing for the user to move the slice. So uh, um, an animation of the slice um, uh, along some axes helps one understand the way the function behaves within the 3D domain. So what is slicing really? Uh, let's take a example in one dimension lower to understand. So what we are saying is that, so, so we are, uh, recall now we are talking about uh, one dimension lower, so the input is actually f defined over a 2D domain, right? So it this is we are talking about a 2D function, um, and let's say that the 2D function is defined over a uh, over a subset of the um, uh, plane. Now, um, the equivalent of a slice is looking at a line and talking about, um, val talking about the restriction of f to this line. So when you look at the restriction of f to this line, we have the following sample points. The other sample points are ignored. So we only care about f restricted to this line L and we have the following sample points. Now this is essentially a 1D function and we know how to uh, handle a 1D function. So let's say we know how to visualize this via a function plot. So we could do that. So we could plot um, the function f or, um, along this line and then we change this line um, by moving it in some direction or uh, alternately what we could do is to have an arbitrarily oriented line. So no, let's first talk about L which is axis aligned. So if X is actually axis aligned that uh, the sample points that we need to look at becomes easy to identify. So these are just the uh, original sample points, right? So. So let's say we have these original sample points uh, that come from a grid 
so the sample points that um, we are talking about um, are restricted to L. Now let's say L is axis aligned. In addition, let's say L passes through some sample points. Then we know that the blue sample points here are a subset of the um, input sample points. Now, of course, this need not be always true, right? So you could have a line there like that. And in this case, we need two points. So the sample points here have to be computed uh, via linear interpolation. We know how to do linear interpolation now within uh, each cell. So we can actually compute these sample points, um, uh, obtain our F restricted to the L, um, and then visualize such a function. So extending this um, I 3D, what we have now is a domain, which is a cube, let's say. And what we would like, the restriction of the function to, um, to, a, uh, to a slice that uh, is computed by taking an intersection of some plane with the domain, right? So this intersection um, will be planar. Now, of course, what we really need is the uh, samples from this intersection. Um, and that's what we need to compute. Um, again, this is easy to compute for axis aligned planes. Um, uh, not too difficult for uh, arbitrary planes, but a little bit more tricky, that's it, right? So once we compute these sample points, uh, we could, uh, we, we have natural, we know that these sample points also can be represented using a grid. Um, and um, we can talk about bilinear interpolation within this grid. So we have a 2D grid now. So F in this case, restricted to this uh, plane P is two dimensional um, and essentially defined over a grid. And uh, we know how to display a, a scalar function um, defined over a 2D grid. So, so slicing is essentially uh, simplifying the problem to something that we know how to solve. Right, so with that introduction, let's move on to the focus of today's lecture, isosurfaces. So contours, which where we talked about uh, these, so, so recall that a contour is essentially the pre-image of a scalar value. So this uh, pre-image holds um, for 3D scalar fields as well. So F inverse of C would essentially lie in R3 and it would actually be a surface in R3 and hence called an isosurface. So here is um, a figure that shows three different isosurfaces at different iso values. So the data here is a CT scan of the uh, foot. And what you see is that different iso values allow um, us to extract different interesting features from this foot data set. Lower values seem to correspond to skin higher values seem to correspond to the bone. So isosurfaces um, uh, are very popular um, to get a first view of the scalar field. They have been studied since the mid 80s um, and uh, continue to be an important technique in the uh, scalar uh, visualization um, 
tool box. But there are several problems with ISO surfaces. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them now. We will discuss them eventually. But one problem is already obvious here. What ISO surface should I display? What value is interesting? Um, when I identify three different values here, 30, 80, and 200, by looking at these three, we know that 80 is of interest and maybe 200 is also of interest. But how do I identify that these are the interesting ISO values? So this is a natural uh, question and uh, a question that was studied by several researchers. But we'll postpone this discussion. Um, we will first talk about how do I even compute such an ISO surface. So let's talk about the computation of ISO surfaces. Before computing um, an ISO surface, I need to know how the data is available to the algorithm. So the scalar field is clearly available as a sample over a domain. Um, the domain is represented using a mesh, which could be a structured uh, or a cube grid such as this or it could be an unstructured mesh where the domain is represented as a collection of triangles. The function is specified at vertices of the mesh in both cases and is interpolated um, within the mesh elements. Um, so in these two cases, linear or bilinear in 2D, linear in 3D and trilinear in uh, in the case of a cube grid. So we will now talk about um, one of the most popular algorithms for uh, extracting um, isosurfaces and isocontours. Uh, but let's try to understand the idea using pictures. My scalar field is available at vertices of a grid. So let's take this example where I have scalar fields. Uh, uh, so, so the scalar values here are actually integers. Towards constructing an isocontour, I first need an explicit representation of the domain. So let's assume we have a grid representing the domain. And uh, uh, let's say I want to find the iso uh, contour at the value 5.5. First we observe that the ISO contour does not pass through every cell within the grid. It passes only to through certain cells. Which ones? Um, the way we identify uh, the cells containing the ISO contour is by labeling the uh, vertices of the cell as positive or negative. Uh, vertex is positive um, such as here if its value is greater than 5.5 and a vertex is negative or minus is marked with a minus sign if uh, the scalar value at that vertex is less than 5.5. Now if we have a plus minus edge such as here then we know for sure that the iso contour passes through this edge. So we know that there is some point here that is contained inside the iso contour. So as a first step the grid points are labeled as plus or minus as shown here. As a first cut approximation, we mark the midpoints of all plus minus edges. We know for sure that the ISO contour passes through these points. So let's just mark the midpoints of these plus minus edges. So uh, just to repeat, 
we start by labeling the um, vertices as plus and minus and then identify the midpoints. We now connect the midpoints. So let me repeat, we now connect the midpoints to get the isocontour. The question is how do we connect? So once we connect we can see that uh, we have the isocontour, the collection of points that uh, map to a given scalar value. The question really is how do I connect these points? So these points that we marked are called isopoints. They are isopoints because uh, they are the set of all points, set of points on the edges that uh, map to the input's ISO value. So we, if you notice here, the uh, the way the ISO points are connected is can be determined within each cell, independent of the adjacent cell. So, for example, this connection is determined com by completely staying within this cell and so on. So the problem really is to identify the connections within each cell. This leads us to a case table. What are the different plus minus configurations and how do we handle them? So this is simple combinatorics. Um, we have four vertices of a cell in a, in a square grid. Each vertex can take two labels, uh, one uh, pause plus and minus. How many different configurations are there? It's clear that there is two to the four different configurations. Um, now there are many of these configurations um, let me say that again, many of these configurations are um, related to each other. So they are symmetric copies of each other and we need not consider all these copies. So for example, let's look at the first case on the top left. This is a case with a single plus and three minus signs. Now this particular case is equivalent to the plus sign appearing in, in any one of the four vertices. So they are all symmetric copies um, uh, up to rotation. So let's take this first case where you have a single plus and three minus. The iso points lie on the plus minus edge and the way to connect them is um, straightforward. Now, how do we know that this is exactly how I connect uh, the ISO points? Um, we assume linear interpolation for now. Uh, later, we will see that this does lead to some trouble. But for now, let's just take the line segment connecting these two ISO points and say that uh, that is a good approximation of my ISO contour. How about the second case, which is also similar to the first case, um, where we flip the uh, plus and minus signs. So this is a case with one minus and three plus. Again, we have two ISO points. They can be connected using a simple red edge. A truly different case is one where we have two plus and two minus. And uh, uh, in this case, we end up with two plus minus edges and hence two iso points which can be connected using a edge, red edge again. The next case is when we have two plus and two minus but uh, with a different configuration than before. So here the plus signs are along uh, the at the diagonal endpoints. So we essentially have four ISO points and here is one way of connecting the ISO points. So note that this way of connecting the ISO points separates the plus signs uh, 
but um, keeps the um, minus signs together. So what this means is that the isocontour um, given by the two um, um, edges uh, separates the um, interior which is shaded from the exterior which is not shaded. Uh, so just to complete this, let me talk about the interior in the other cases. So the interior here is like this. The interior in the other cases are so. All right. Um, now again, um, the final case on the bottom right should already raise some questions in your mind. Uh, why did I connect the four ISO points in this particular manner? Why not the other way around? Now this is again another important question uh, that arose after the first algorithm uh, for computing the ISO surface, these ISO surfaces was published. We will again talk about that soon. So the algorithm as I presented here extends directly to 3D. So here is a video that illustrates the uh, what happens in 3D. So in 3D we have a cube grid and the algorithm marches through the cubes one at a time. Within each cube it identifies the ISO points, connects them via triangles and um, hence computes the isosurface. So here is one cube, each vertex is classified as either positive or negative. And um, this gives us a particular case, a case table is built and uh, the, the particular case corresponding to this cell is used to, add, to determine uh, what set of triangles to report. Um, so in this case we have uh, this triangle um, one and then another uh, collection of triangles. So these two surfaces constitute the isosurface lying within this particular grid cell. So the algorithm proceeds by processing the uh, cubes one at a time, extracting the isocontour and um, at the end we have a collection of triangles that represent the isosurface. The full video is available here, I will let you look at it later. The algorithm that we saw in the previous slide is called the marching cubes algorithm. This was introduced by Lorentzen and Klein. It essentially uh, steps through the entire grid and constructs the isosurface by processing the uh, grid cells one at a time. The algorithm assumes a bilinear interpolant and like I said, it first um, classifies the vertices as belonging to the interior or exterior, negative and positive, and uses a case table to um, extract the isosurface within each cell. Several papers have proposed different case tables. Each case table um, it has some unique properties in the sense that they either uh, reduce the number of cases um, or uh, ensure some correctness of the isosurface or um, uh, try to reduce the number of triangles that are generated for the isosurface and so on. 
So here is one case table that is quite popular written by Greg Nielsen from 2003. You can already see that from the 80s to 2003, uh, marching cubes has been a, uh, um, uh, an object of study. And it was actually a fairly active area of research until the mid 2000s uh, when the case was more or less closed. So let's look at some of these cases in 3D. So here is a positive vertex um, and with seven other negative vertices. So, so this leads to three plus minus edges, hence three isopoints. So in 3D, you um, connect them via a triangle. And so this will be the case corresponding to 1 plus and 7 minus. So here is a case with 2 plus and uh, 4 plus uh, and 4 minus. Um, we again uh, identify the isopoints and connect them via triangles. So in this case you um, consider a quad and, with, and triangulate it into uh, two triangles. Here is another case, four isopoints again, two triangles. Again, um, six isopoints in this case, um, four triangles, and so on. So the, the cases do get more and more complicated. Um, so here are a few more cases where, so in this particular situation, you have six um, I, uh, isopoints which have to be connected. There are more than one ways to connect. Um, so here is one with again six isopoints. Um, again in this case it's connected as two triangles. It could be connected differently. Um, here is one again with has eight isopoints and in this case it's connected into two quads or four triangles. Now in these cases the connections could have been um, performed differently. Um, in the next lecture, what we will study is um, how do we resolve this ambiguity in the connections. So this was actually one of the uh, primary topics that could not be resolved for at least two decades. So the 2003 paper more or less finalized this discussion. Um, the original marching cubes paper appeared in the mid 80s. So for almost 20 years, this uh, problem of ambiguity or problem of connecting the isopoints into triangles was uh, could not be resolved. So uh, even though the problem seemed simple, it could not be solved.